joining us, welcome. And welcome back to each of you who have attended this circle of knowledge. Your Office of Alumni Relations created this space to embrace our newest alumni since our traditional 2020 was paused. As we move through our present time, the From Pause to Clause Alumni Speaker Series remains relevant. Yet on this day, you will have another moment of receiving prominent information. As always, the topics support and strengthen the knowledge base of our current students, recent alumni, those who have worn the badge of honor as alums for years, and friends of Clark Atlanta University. We look forward to greeting you at each webinar. Likewise, we wish to thank the alumni panelists who have presented in the past and those presenting today. We did not seek you out, yet you came running with the spirit of a mighty panther, which we are, sharing your expertise when the call went forth. Before we move into today's discussion, let me share a tad bit of history on the Office of Alumni Relations signature event. The Alumni Student Networking event was originally designed in 2008 when Kareem Taylor, class of 2010, in his sophomore year expressed that students should be engaged and learn from alumni of our one exceptional university. Over the years, we continuously called on members of the alumni community to embrace our alumni in waiting, known as students. We encircle them until they become full alumni. As Panther Cubs, they develop through discovery, academically, socially, and spiritually, finding their ways as their paws grow claws. And they become fully entrenched felines of service locally, nationally, and globally, while remembering to provide financial support to the institution that placed them on their path of well-rounded citizens. There is more to this program, which can be found on the CAU website. And speaking of financial support, we are halfway to reaching our goal of $1 million. Please remember to share your heart with CAU. As we begin our conversation, I would like to express thanks to my colleague, Chastity B. Evans, class of 2010, who serves as a program manager in the Office of Alumni Relations. She will be your host, for she created this space for our interaction. Chastity, it's now time for you to begin the exchange. Thank you so much, alumna Galen E. Gatewood Joshua for that admired introduction and credible context. Welcome everyone. Thank you all for joining your Office of Alumni Relations for the miseducation and power of the Black Radio. Plug in your speakers. A phenomenal thank you to alumna Dr. Michelle Rhodes, Program Specialist for the Office of Online Learning and Continuing Education for being the technical commander behind all of OAR's webinars. Today, we are going to explore and learn the importance of Black radio in America, how it's being received and its impact on Black identity. Just a little housekeeping before we get started. If you have any questions during the presentation, please type them into your Q&A box in your Zoom control panel, and we will be sure to get to them during our Q&A session to discuss. Now, without further ado, introducing our first alumnus for this evening, or for this afternoon. When Usher embarked on his first promo tour, who did he call? When Steve Harvey needed a well-rounded DJ for his 2017 Sand and Foul Festival in the Bahamas, who did he call? When Grammy Award winner Jill Scott got married, who 
who does she get to DJ her wedding reception? The unanimous answer is DJ Mars, a staple in the global party scene. DJ Mars has lent his talents to many of the world's most sought after celebrities. DJ Mars's list of artists in which he has toured with reads like a Grammy nomination ceremony. Usher, Neo, Sierra, Monica, Khalees, Carrie Hilson, Keisha Cole have all relied on his ability to bring the party to the stage. DJ Mars recently wrapped up the Great Escape Tour where he was the tour DJ for R&B superstar Monica, selling out in arenas across the country. DJ Mars's influence doesn't stop at the turntables. Through his various brand partnerships, DJ Mars has worked directly with corporations including New Balance, New Era, Starter, and Monster Products. While most DJs' sole wish is to be a part of a marketing campaign, for DJ Mars, his goal was to create one. Mars's business acumen has led to marketing deal with footwear giant New Balance. The campaign, Where Are You Running To Next, was created by DJ Mars and has gained over 100 million viral impressions. Again, not afraid to step beyond the turntables, DJ Mars is also an accomplished author. Mars's book, The Art Behind the Tape, is a coffee table book that details the rich history of mixtape culture. Originally from Springfield, Massachusetts, DJ Mars now calls Atlanta home. Welcome, DJ Mars. How are you doing today? Hey, hey, hey. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. How are you? Doing well, and thank you so much for always continuing to support your alma mater. Of course. Of course. Well, we're going to go ahead and dive right into your first question for today. Is that cool? Mm -hmm. Yep, no problem. All right. Reflecting on America's history, our history, Black radio stations, and emergence of radio DJs, were considered as important as ministers and politicians in mobilizing support for the civil rights movement of the 1960s, post-civil rights movement era of the 1970s, Black recognition and excellence in the 1980s, the continual to, to advance with setbacks in the 1990s, and the early 2000s and now. What was your process stepping behind the turntables when evolving beyond them? What was my process from going from being a DJ to an author slash entrepreneur? Is that kind of what the question is? Yes, it is. Um, I always wanted to do more, right? So I learned from the people in, you know, in front of me, you can't, you can't just do one thing. And the one thing that I was known for was DJing. And it was like, okay, you're cool, you're good at that, but in order to to step up, to elevate, you have to do more. There's a million DJs. So what's gonna separate, there's a million great DJs at that. So what's gonna separate you from the other great DJs and it's the things that you do aside from just DJing, right? So if you look at DJ Khaled, the name DJ Lynn Khaled, you know, says that he's a DJ, but he's most known for producing great songs. If you look at DJ Drama, same scenario. He's a physical DJ, cut scratches and all of that, but he's known for running a record label. And Drama went to Clark as well. Um, so what, what I learned is adding the bullet points to my name and that adds value. Again, there's a, there's a million great DJs. And there's another great DJ on this, on this call. And he'll get, you know, we'll get to Brian in a second because his, bullet points after his name is like a Christmas list. So I, I just had to add value to my name by adding other pieces to the puzzle. Adding value, I, I love that, I love that. And we all in this um, new normal now, as they're, as, as they're starting to call it, we all yeah. have to learn how to add value because yeah. we, we're valuable people and we are a strong influence group. So. Yeah. Yeah. Wouldn't you agree that we as African Americans are a strong influencer group? I mean, oh, yeah. The 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 number one um, exported commodity in America is urban culture, and we lead the we lead the charge in that. I, I say this from firsthand knowledge. You know, I've, between the artists, different artists that I work with, I've had the ability and the blessing to travel the globe and see how 
Black America influences the globe. And I'll give an example. One day I was in Dublin, Ireland, and there was, you know, a bunch of Irish kids, clearly, you know, they're, they're, they're white. But I, I see the Atlanta look on these Irish kids. Like in the Atlanta look is they were wearing Atlanta Braves hats. Mm -hmm. They were they were wearing um, filas, just like like the classic filas that, that A-Town kids wear. Um, at the time, they were wearing long um, white T-shirts, which is which was an Atlanta staple. So the I, I rock seen, with an era. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Lean with a rock with it. So I saw firsthand how Atlanta culture has moved well beyond the borders and well beyond uh, uh, um, well beyond our initial scope. I've saw it firsthand where we influence kids in different parts of the world. I've seen kids in London look like kids from College Park. I've seen kids in South Africa look like kids from College Park. Like literally with my own two eyes, I've seen them dress and emulate the style that, that is running the streets here in Atlanta. So there's no doubt that Black culture uh, 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 influences the world. In particular, uh, Atlanta's version of Black culture is definitely a heavy influencer in that space. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, alumnus Tom, uh, well, DJ Mars, for bringing the culture, <laughs> for bringing the culture and the insight on, you know, how you are shifting your dynamics, you know, to, yeah. of course, retain your experiences and your entrepreneurial mindset. So thank you for that. No problem. If you all have any questions for DJ Mars, please type them into our Q&A box in your Zoom control panel now, and we'll be sure to get to them during our Q&A session. Thank you again. Yep. All right. Up next is our shining star, alumnus Shed Jackson. Shed Jackson is the Communications and Marketing Director for National Public Radio, NPR, affiliate station Jazz 91.9 WCLK. He oversees branding, positioning, multimedia marketing, as well as community engagement initiatives. Due in part to alumnus Jackson's marketing creation, the radio station reached its highest ratings ever in its 45 year history with a weekly listenership of 222,000. That's remarkable, congratulations. Jackson received a certificate of congressional recognition for outstanding and invaluable service to the community as well as the coveted Gabby Award for Georgia Association of Broadcasters. He was recognized as 40 under 40, Georgia Best and Brightest by Georgia Trend, is an Atlanta Regional Commission's Art Leader of Metro Atlanta, and a member of the National Academy of Recording Arts and Sciences Atlanta chapter. He earned a Bachelor of Science degree in biology with a minor in chemistry from the University of Alabama at Birmingham. Alumnus Jackson earned an MBA with a concentration in marketing and has completed Master of Arts degree studies in teaching science education at Clark Atlanta University. How are you doing today, Alumnus Jackson? What's going I'm cool. on? I'm cool. I'm cool. How are you? You stay cool. You stay cool. I <laughs> don't have that braids head on. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> Goes back to what DJ Mars was speaking about, that culture. Exactly, exactly. Well, we're going to jump right into your first question for today. Is that cool? Cool. All right. Historian William Barlow explained in his 1995 paper, Black Music on Radio During the Jazz Age, the radio industry withered during the financial collapse and major radio stations opted to hire white artists to cover Black songs on radio for a majority white audience. The African-Americans who created these art forms and styles were not only victimized by the theft of their material, but were often forced to compromise their art and integrity to gain entrance into the entertainment industry, which was white controlled and racially segregated. As the communications and marketing director for Jazz 91.9 WCLK, do you sense this is a practice major record companies have been very persistent at? I mean, mining black music, slang and fashion for its cultural cachet? Um. You know, I think DJ Mars explained it, you know, pretty well how, you know, he went over seas into different cultures and saw how, you know, the, the black culture 
uh, is influencing not only the hyper local community but internationally. But 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 what I can say, and I heard this from someone, I can't remember where, but it was like you can find everything in black. You know what I'm saying? You know, our community is just just so diverse and, 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 and so expansive that, I, yeah, I, I do believe that um, record labels and, and, and the general market culture period, you know, look to us for trends and other, um, I would say, cultural consciousness um, to take place. And in particularly in, in radio, you know, although we have, um, some African Americans doing great things. There are very few African Americans at the top and, and, and on, on a high level in a lot of these these radio sections, and they do our best to keep us away. And and, and that's why I applaud you know some artists um, for creating their own labels and, and and creating their own distributions and you know holding the copyrights to their own material and and point, case in point rather, um, I applaud Clark and Young University for realizing the value in our voices by starting the first um, educational access radio station, that being WCLK in Georgia. So in 1974, you know, Clark Atlanta University understood the value of the black voice. And in that, you know, you, you can come to, to stations like WCLK and we have a, a couple of other stations who are actually, um, in the public radio paradigm um, that are licensed by uh, an, an HBCU. So, you know, um, I, I, I do think, yeah, artists, particularly those early artists were, were victimized by a lot of the things that were taking place in the music industry, particularly with um, their creative materials. Exactly. I mean, they really back then definitely did not have a black voice, so. Yeah, and, and, and still now, you know, it's, it's like um, those who don't necessarily uh, want to work in, in that, white majority type of, of, of paradigm. That's why you have the, the rise of a lot of self-publishing and a lot of independent artists who really, you know, um, taking ownership, like I said, of their material so that some of the things that were experienced in the past aren't so prevalent today. Exactly. Well, over the years, you see in the 1920s and 1930s, black music was very underground, very benign, marginalized. When it became mainstream, it became disassociated from the Black experience and Black context known as cultural appropriation. Borrowing or sampling sounds like nice words because they sound like an equal exchange. But here, but there's a power dynamic embedded in that borrowing. How can future artists, producers, and songwriters utilize their monetary influence to take and secure ownership of their own craft? I would say first, and, and first of all, and I've spoken with many artists and musicians, just people in business, period. Get everything in writing. You know, um, a, a lot of times we speak on that he say, she say things, and you know, and, and you never really have any type of um, valid written communication to go back to. You know, so I, I suggest first, get it in writing. You know, and, and then two on the, the business or entrepreneurial end, I mean, start, create a business plan. It goes back to the whole notion of, of writing it on the wall and making it plain. You know, um, by ensuring that you're focused and have a blueprint to success, um, you're not really leaving in, any stones unturned. Um, but most importantly, I, I say, get things in writing and secure some legal counsel and a good account. You know, we got so many, um, you know, changes in business and, and operations and, and, and the way we handle um, capital gain and profits. So I, I suggest, yeah, yeah, legal counsel and accounting and put this stuff in writing to ensure that, you know, um, your material isn't borrowed without your knowledge or, you know, you, you listen to the radio one day and you hear, hey, is that my bed that's going on? I mean, cause that, that does happen. I mean, here recently, so funny, recently, you know, at the station, we got a, an email from a, a gentleman saying, you know, we use this photo. And so he wasn't aware of even how his material was made access or available to the masses to use. And, and that took him back to just, yo, you weren't really handling your business because what you thought was yours isn't really yours. Not yours. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I would say really, you know, look to a lot of um, research, written material, legal counsel and professional services. All right. You guys, you, you're hearing it. 
right from these powerhouses mouths. So, you know, ensure that you follow those protocols because they are in these seats right now. They are telling you exactly what you need to do and how you need to do it, you know, in order to ensure that your information is secure and that you are not robbed of anything. You know, it's all about winning for us. So, well, thank you so much, Alumnus Jackson, for the fundamental tips and for the knowledge always that you would like to drop. So if you all have any questions for Alumnus Jackson, please type them into the Q&A box in your Zoom control panel now, and we'll be sure to get to them during our Q&A session. Cool. All right, coming up next is Alumnus Brian Michael Cox. Alumnus Cox is widely regarded as one of the most critically acclaimed and commercially successful songwriters and producers in the history of contemporary R&B music. His work with superstars like Usher, Jermaine Dupri, Mary J. Blige, Mariah Carey, Diddy, Justin Bieber, Chris Brown, Tony Braxton, Trey Songs, and Jagged Edge, just to name a few has solidified him as a mainstay in the world of pop music. With over 100 million record sales, nine Grammy Awards, countless SCSHC Songwriter of the Year Awards, and induction to the Georgia Music Hall of Fame and co-writing Billboard's top R&B song of all time, Mary J. Blige's Be Without You, he shows no signs of slowing down as he has currently been in the studio with an entire new generation of artists that define the new urban landscape like LMA, Division, Internet Money, Derek Milano, Ari Lennox, and um, Six, is it Six Black? To just to name a, fruit, a few. And yes, of course, he's a product of Clark Atlanta University. Yes, he is all day. How are you doing today, Alumnus Cox? What's going I'm, on? I'm good. How are you? Doing well. Doing well. Awesome. You definitely. I always see you. You're always on the ground. Always. <laughs> yeah, I'm very, I'm doing something. I'm always. You know what I'm <laughs> well, that's good. That's what makes you younger. So hey, keep keep, yeah. <laughs> keep pushing. We're gonna go into your first question for today as well. Is that okay? Okay. All right. The aforementioned Reed and Rome, Chairman, CEO, and President of Epic Records respectfully, came up in the 1970s, part of an influx of Black executives, managers, and producers to enter the mainstream music industry when labels were looking to capture Black audiences. Yeah. Progress that has been all but been reversed in the years since. As an African-American male songwriter and producer who has helped shape the history of contemporary R&B and pop music, how did it take, well, how long did it take for you to capture your targeted audience and reach your high and why? Um, I would say that in any process, when you are trying to discover who you are creatively, it's gonna take some time. You know what I mean? Um, it took me, you know, I would say from the time I got to Clark, I got to, I got to Clark in 97, I immediately started my journey when I got there. Um, to, to, to becoming a producer. Um, so I'll say from, from 97, it, it, I would say it took me about a good three to four years uh, to find that pocket, you know what I'm saying? Um, mm -hmm. With development, you know, with help, you know, I, I was able to uh, uh, connect with, uh, you know, a company called Noontime early on um, before anybody knew who I was and develop that craft, you know what I mean? Of creating um, records. Um, and it was just being around, like at the end of the day, like, you know, I was going, I was going to school and I was, you know, uh, had met drama and was hanging out with him and the, we going back and forth for records. And then I started meeting people who were creatively sound on campus and a lot of that really on top of me, you know, I, I was in the Philharmonic Society. I played piano for, you know, for the Philharmonics. I was marching band. So I was surrounded um, a, a, around kids who were into urban culture and into what was happening at the time. Mm -hmm. um, that inspired me when I went off to do, you know, when I went off to create whatever I was creating from a production perspective. So I would say about four years, you know, I would say, I started making records, I started, I had my first hit record in 99, but then I would say, I would say 2001 is when I really 
when it really started to click for me, like, okay, I, I know exactly what I'm going for. You know what I mean? Um, so I would say about, for me, it was like maybe three or four years, but it was a, a, an intense three or four years because I was, I was still in school. I was trying to make it, I was trying to get noticed. I got, I did this developmental deal that was kind of like in the air, you know, I was the little guy in the back making beef that nobody was buying, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> and then I had an opportunity to work with uh, Brian and Brandon Case from Jagged Edge. And then that opened up uh, 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 a, lot, a lot of opportunities for me. You know what I'm saying? So awesome. And that's yeah. still one of the best CDs out now. Like I I you see it. Jay Heartbreak. <laughs> yes, yes. I mean, it made my whole middle school. I didn't know at all what they were talking about. But you know, I thought I <laughs> so what do you think about the term urban in the music industry? I mean, do you see mm. that it provides black executives with a true voice, an opportunity to run and manage an aspect of the music business that was largely, you know, being ignored by corporations? Or do you think it's a veiled synonym for black, which ends up harming and limiting the black artists and executives it is supposed to protect? What's your, you know, what's your thoughts on that? That is a really, Really good question. Um, coming up, right? I, I remember in the '80s when I was young and looking at, you know, trying to, you know, dreaming about being in the music business as a kid. There used to be black music divisions, like there used to be, you know, it was like, you know, black music and then it was pop music, right? And black music, there were a lot of people who lived in this black music division box, right? So let's say the Frank Beverly May, Shalimar, you know, all these different artists, Kashif, you know, these artists that lived in this box and they would sell platinum, double platinum, triple platinum. And there was black executives that were like president of black music and all, this, all, of, it, all of it meant something. I, 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 I could be wrong, but based on my history, what, I, what I've researched, it, it feels like when the black music divisions came up in the seventies, like you acknowledge Sylvia Rohn, you know, in the late seventies coming in the eighties. Um, and into, well into the nineties, I felt like we were we were we were better off um when it was when when it was black music divisions and and people crossed like a Whitney crossed or like you know a Michael crossed or Prince crossed, you know what I mean? But I felt like we were better off because we were still selling albums, like lots of albums amongst ourselves when we had a direct, you know. Uh, uh, a direct department that handled it, right? And we have black executives that in that that filled that department up that were that were e uh, emotionally attached to these projects, at least some of them, right? Um, I think urban. I mean, throughout the years, we've, we've seen it. We've seen it. You know, shift, shift, shift. They they stop having black music departments. Everything kind of got merged and. And now we're in this thing where it's urban and and um, they use the word urban. And I I think I think it is a veil. In my personal opinion, I think it is a veil. Um, we don't see as many black executives at the top. You know, I mean, the ones that are there, like Sylvia's at the top, you know, L.A. Reid owns his own label. You know, we know we see Shaka. We see people who, you know, who are up there really doing their thing. But it doesn't seem like it's as much of, you know, as much of a culture as it was when it was like black music divisions. You know what I'm saying? This is my personal opinion. Yeah, um, it's, it's, it's um, nothing really to be proud about like anymore, like how it used to be. Yeah, I mean, you know, but also it's a lot of independence though now. Yeah. So I feel like what's, what's replaced the black music department is independent artists controlling their own destiny and um, and building their own their own thing, you know what I mean? And it's a lot of them. So we have Coach and P, and we have people who build their own institutions now. And I think that that's kind of what replaced the the black music division uh, thing. But it still feels like, you know, uh, it just still feels like in the major labels, it's not that culture doesn't exist, you know what I mean? And that's to me, I feel um, it's unfortunate. Because you know, back in the day, you know, I, we used to a Lowell Silas Jr. was somebody who we really, you know, was looking to. You know what I'm saying? You know, uh, uh, you know, uh, Jeff Red, uh, you know, like you said, Sylvia Rome, L.A. Reid, and these people we were really looking to, to, um, to give us our opportunities. You know what I'm saying? Um, and uh, 
you know, you didn't, you know, you didn't really get on Tommy Matola's radar until you got Beat. on, you know, till you got to a certain level, you know what I'm saying? As a you black artist, <laughs> you know, as a black artist, you didn't really get on, you know, their radar. You know what I mean? You know, only Clive Davis was the only one that was running around, you know, really looking for black artists. You know what I'm saying? Um, um, that's based on what, you know, I experienced in the late 90s coming up. You know what I mean? It was really about like these black labels, these black music divisions giving us these opportunities. My first song deal was with uh, Columbia Records through Trackmasters. It was a black, Michael Malden was the head of the black, <laughs> head of black music division. And my first song deal was at Columbia, before So So Deaf, my first song deal was at Columbia Records with Michael Malden, who was the head of black music. That was my first opportunity. So, um, you know, I don't know if that kind of energy exists or it may exist in a different way, but I don't know if that kind of energy exists. You know, I wasn't looking for him until I was looking for Michael Malden because I knew he was the head of black music. You know what I'm saying? So, you know, and I knew it meant something then. I don't know if it means anything now because every, I mean, everything's always been black music, but now everything is so blended. You know what I'm saying? Um, I don't know if it means anything now in my, in, in my personal opinion. Well, I'm hoping that, you know, eventually now that we're all into this um, diversity and inclusion, you know, type element now, you know, and now that a lot of uh, companies that kind of swept us away or either didn't have us at all are starting to bring more of us up to the top now, you know, to get our opinions because things aren't selling like they thought they were going to sell or, you know, due to this pandemic, it's kind of decreased massively. I'm hoping that maybe they will take some advice or take some type of initiative in order to bring that, you know, bring that back, bring back. You know, what's interesting though about the pandemic in my personal opinion is that I was was having a conversation with my my manager the other day about it was going over my publishing statement and Mm -hmm. The pandemic actually has been, for me personally, been very good for, for me as far as music perspective, because people been, people was at the crib and the streams went up and everything went crazy. Mm-hmm. And we were going over my statement and I was like, yo, like we really made some paper this past, uh, <laughs> this past <laughs> quarter, you know, this past year. Like I didn't realize, you know what I mean? You know, because I, 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 you know, when you get the checks, your business manager gets deposited. I'm like, oh, I got this amount of money in the bank. I wasn't, really, you know, I, until I went over my statements, doing my taxes, going over my statements. I'm like, oh, me and Chris was going over them just like maybe like a week ago. And I was like, oh, snap, like we made some money last year. And because, because you know, the pandemic, people at home and listen to music more, they're streaming more, they're streaming their favorite records over and over again. They're, re- they're rediscovering old records, they're, re- they're rediscovering new records. Artists start sampling. You know, I was getting sample clearances like damn it every other, you know, every other day this past year because p- p- people at the crib making music and they need samples cleared, you know what I mean? And then songs come out and then they stream. So interestingly enough, the pandemic has been very, I mean, always, I mean, with me DJing online, with my publishing catalog, like the pandemic has been pretty fruitful for me the past year. I, I you know. I must say, I was very, very surprised at the numbers that came back. So, well, that's you good. Know. When you win, we all win, win, win. So, 100%. so no doubt. But thank you so much, Alumnus Cox, for your intellect you. and determination to continue to push forward. We, you know, we're, you. we're proud of each and every last one of you all on this call. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank if you. you have any questions for Alumnus Cox, please type them into our Q&A box in your Zoom control panel now, and we'll be sure to get to them during our Q&A session. All right, guys, and now the marathon continues. Lastly, introducing our last but never least panelist for this afternoon is Alumnus Shaka Zulu. Zulu is the CEO, or well, the co-CEO of Deserving the Peace Records and Emmy Sun Entertainment Incorporated both based in Atlanta, Georgia. Alumnus Zulu has been making his mark in the music and entertainment business for over 20 years. He began his music career while attending college as an intern for various record labels and as an on-air personality for WRFG, a community-based radio station in Atlanta. He later became the music director and an on-air personality for Atlanta's Hot 97.5, now 107.9 radio station. Zulu has also been an integral piece in bringing artists and influential people to South Africa and has worked with several South African music groups. 
Some of his other professional accomplishments are radio promotions for Sony Music, Columbia Records, radio promotions for Universal Music Group, Island, Def Jam, music, Ludacris Foundation board member, keynote speaker at the National Fatherhood Conference in 2004, and video music video director. Alumnus Zulu is also a founder of the lifestyle brand, Cultural Republic, which was founded alongside other proven entertainment executives, Jason Jeter and Bernard Parks Jr. These gentlemen successively launched and navigated the brands of international superstars such as T.I., Ludacris, 2 Chains, Travis Scott, Iggy Azalea, Outkast, CeeLo Green, 8-Ball and MJG, B.O.B., DJ Drama, and Big Crit. How are you doing today, alumnus Zulu? Thank you so much for being on this call and for always putting your alums on deck. We are so happy and proud to have you today. How are you doing? Good, glad to be here. I'm, you Can you hear me? Yes, sir, I can. Glad to be here, thank you for having me. No problem, no problem. Discussion. I wanna answer everybody's question. I'm sitting here itching like. <laughs> Excited. <laughs> Well, we're gonna go ahead and go into your questions there so we can go ahead and get you uh, get you rolling, all right? Mm -hmm. So rap has been around for over four decades and the majority of artists shaping the culture are black. Mm -hmm. White executives still control music, well, much of the music industry, but streaming puts more power in the hands of listeners to determine an artist's success on the charts. Do you believe the lack of black leadership has hurt black radio? or is it transforming to transcend into the new normal digital world? And why? What's your opinion? Ooh, hi, right. where do I go from it? Right, I'll say this, lack of black leadership harms everything, not just streaming, not just radio, but the whole gamut of us being in this uh, business. You know, to the point where, where you asked Brian Michael Cox about you know, you know, the black music department. Mm -hmm. um, you know, those were very strategic things that were done in changing those names and turning it into urban because, you know, it, it, you know, black was specific. And that means it had to be cultivated, curated by mm -hmm. us, for us. When you say urban, now I can put a white face there. You know what I mean? And be like, well, we're all urban because it's, you know, a, a, it's a, a genre or a style as opposed to a community, right? But what, what happens is, is we don't get to define our blackness, so to speak. Exactly. You know what I'm saying? A black executive is looking, would say, well, Brian Michael Cox is, in a, is an amazing writer because I understand the experience in which he's writing from, you know, as opposed to telling somebody, I got to go get a Dr. Luke, you know what I'm saying, to, to write a record. And the same thing in radio. Um, when we're looking at radio and the basis of what radio is, and I'm pretty sure Shed can speak to this, uh, was, you know, the radio disc jockey or DJs were our voice. You know what I mean? Like they were speaking not only to the music that they played, but to whatever the current topic in the community was. So then when you get into large scale radio, right? Uh, you know, these conglomerates, then it became a very programmable thing, right? And so therefore we had a playlist was very strict. Your, your breaks would, would cut down. You could only talk about certain things. We don't wanna have these long-winded conversations. And then now we have robotic folks. Now we have stars, you know, major breakouts like a Steve Harvey, you know what I'm saying? Or, 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 or you know, there's a number of people that have went into, um, you know, uh, uh, large scale um, shows that were on multiple stations that became stars because they kept their voice. But for the most part, you don't hear a lot of radio DJs that have real authentic voice. That's also became the death of radio because when radio became, you know, mainstream or homogenous, but basically if I was in New York, I'm listening to the same music that I'm listening to in LA, I'm listening to the same music that I'm listening to in Chicago, the localized perspective of radio was lost. And that is also consistent with removing the voice of the local DJ and the local culture, as well as black leadership. Well, how people in Chicago talk is different than people in Atlanta, different than people in New Orleans, different, right? 
So usually you'll hear one or two people locally on her, but for the most part, their playlists are the same. You know what I'm saying? And I remember when when it, it, when I was at WRG, and I even interned at CLK uh, as well. But when I was at WRG, I had to go through. I had to get an FCC license. I had to go through the whole process of understanding radio, and then from there, psychologically, I read a few other books, and then I understood what I needed to be doing programming wise. And you know, there was also WRAS, WREK. There was a good college network in this town. And then it was commercial radio, which was V103. V103 played minimal hip hop. And if they did, it was top 10 hip hop, whatever was on the billboard chart, so commercialized. So it gave us such a space, CLK could do it, RFG, RAS, REK could play whatever we wanted to and break through and, and have some type of space. That local mindset is what catapults and one, it mines, it data mines, and, and it creates a culture where new artists can be developed, right? And then built up into a mainstream space, right? But we've seen this in culture, period. We've seen it at record labels. We've seen it at, you, you name it, we've seen it, right? So now we're talking about systemic things. There's systemic things in, in this industry, and then there's the culture of this industry. And we are, we're battling, especially in this global shift of the current space of Blackness, we're battling, we're battling, literally battling, trying to get people like Brian Michael Cox, who sold almost, I don't want to mis misquote, but definitely millions, almost billions of records, is not the head of a, one of these companies, right? That, that, that doesn't make sense exactly. in, any, in any fashion, shape, or form, right? Scalable business is scalable business. It's a proven record that he can sell and write and create and sell to billions of people, something is valuable about that guy. So there's, but there's no, you know, no process of getting him to C-suite. And what that is, is to, his, to Brian's conversation, independence was necessary. It wasn't necessarily the best thing, but it was necessary because our music was not being moved or more people digging deep enough for music that was connecting with us as people. We have to understand the music industry, for the most part, is, is a criminal enterprise. It was started by the mafia, right? And if you think, you understand, let's say before, and I'm, I'm gonna say maybe it was the 30s, maybe the 40s, when the, the industry was so-called created. Mm -hmm. um, maybe it could have been a little bit later. But for the most part, before that, before press music, somebody basically was traveling around. The only places you could consume music was your home, church, or your juke joints, right? This is this is how culture moved back then. And so you had these guys that would travel and they would go to, oh, it's Mississippi here, blues at, and say, listen, if I give you $100, I can put you on this piece of plastic and then I can sell you to the rest of the country. And they're like, $100? From, for playing this guitar? Of course, right? <laughs> so then they're like, well, because I paid you the $100, $100, I own this. Not only do I own this piece of plastic, I own what's on the plastic, right? So we're like, wait, you know, this is nobody knowing, this somebody's creating this out of thin air. Then you add in the radio component because they're like, well, now that I'm trying to take this thing that I think is amazing that I saw in this juke joint right here in, in, in Hazelhurst, Mississippi, I need to get this to the people in New York. Now, radio was there, right? So they say, okay, well, how do we get this onto radio? And that, if you look at Cadillac Records or some of these, you started seeing how Payola and all of these different things, there's a book um, you, 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 should, you should read or everybody should read if you want to understand the, this aspect of the business called The Hitman, right? Yeah. And it's literally about how radio was the, 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 the carriage to pop culture. Mm -hmm. And then there's a dynamic in there because urban radio, rhythmic radio, and I, won't, I don't like to use the word pop, but crossover radio was, right? And all that is is audience. So it even goes back to your question is like, well, without black leadership, how do I get a record that's moving in the street all the way over here to this audience to say, you know, it can sell 20 million records by getting on crossover radio. And what is crossover radio? Right? Or what now they call pop radio, right? And so these are the debates that we have a lot because I would I would argue 
anytime you leave your core audience and go to another audience, it's crossover, right? Mm -hmm. So they had to start. But when you say pop, pop is weird, right? Would you say Brian Michael Cox is a pop producer? Most people would say no, right? And then they were like, oh, well, Dr. Luke is a pop producer or Benny Blanco or whoever or whatever. Well, what is pop? Pop is not a sound. Even though people would believe that it is, pop is not a sound. Popular is what's popular. It's two things. It's, po it's what's popular, but it's also an audience. There's a pop audience. There's an audience that by construct, which we could say crossover mainstream white audience that consumes a certain type of music. And how do we get young black artists from a DJ that starts with Mars, Mars could be out somewhere, hear records, start spinning it in the clubs, on the radio, and on his shows and tours. Mm -hmm. Then he'll upstream it to somebody like a Shed and say, Shed up here, like Shed, this is a record that's moving. I'm seeing a culture around this. Can you put this on the airway? That takes it broader. And then somebody like myself or Brian Michael Cox would be like, yo, we want to sign that or work with that and bring it into, into a greater space. That's kind of like how it should flow. And then at that point, we hit certain ceilings because if we don't have, and we've had a few greats, right, in these positions, but we haven't had what we need to have. Yeah. Um, in the Sylvia Rones, in the LA Reeds, in the who have you, to be able to hold these positions, but we don't have a real culture of it, right? It's really streamlined, right? Mm -hmm. But not to say that white people can't hear great black music. You know, I met Erdogan who started Atlanta Records. Obviously, Clive Davis. There's a bunch of people. White people they, love it. they can look out and see within and say, that's some amazing stuff. But so can we. And then we should also be able to define, which is probably the battle that we're in. And I'll let a question, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll slow down here. The battle that we're in today is when we're trying to say, right now, culturally, our music is, is degrading and, and hurtful and out of context of what the global shift of our people is, it's a real battle right now. Like we're in a global shift of blackness from youth all the way up to elders, but the music and the culture of this entertainment industry is not reflecting that change. And therefore it's creating this dynamic of internal conflict and war within our culture and within our business. Because we're right now, and, and we can get into the streaming, I, I just went to, you know, two years of college, you know, working at Spotify. Um, and it was, it was intentional for me to go back there to understand the current mindset uh, and the future mindset of music and entertainment that streamable artists are, are, are not long lasting artists. You know what I'm saying? To, to Brian Michael's uh, point, um, now you're seeing with everything that's going on, people are seeking for emotion and connectivity. So they're going back to catalog. That's a whole nother conversation about copyright and ownership. It goes back to my story about that, that guy who paid a hundred dollars to put somebody on vinyl and now he owns everything. Yep. <laughs> so then when 50 years later, somebody finds a record or they sample the record or DJ Mars just happens to dust that vinyl off and does an amazing set online and people are uh, uh, shazamming that song and then it has a new life. <laughs> who gets the benefit of that? There's a lot of uh, intricacies in there within a lot of, lot of break this industry down depending upon where, you know, where everybody's interest lies. Interesting. Well, I see now we definitely um, will need to have a part two to this webinar because, you know, that's a lot of gold nuggets. Like someone said in the um, in the chat, that's a lot of information that you shared. And we definitely need to break it down to further understand because, you know, that industry is booming, it's growing. And we have students here that want to do it each and every day. So in order for them not to get caught up or, you know, get swindled out or something like that, they need this type of information, you know, to go forth with. And you've already answered your second question. So we're going to go ahead and go to your other questions that you have in the box. Is that okay? Definitely. All right. Well, thank you so much, Alumna Zulu, for breaking it down and for always captivating us and educating us on the journey, you know, especially in the radio industry. Well, in the industry, period. If you all have any questions for alumnus Zulu, please type them into our Q&A box in your Zoom control panel now, and we'll be sure to get them on and read and listened to um, during our Q&A session. Thank you again. You're welcome. Thank you to our alumni panelists for bringing their passion, expertise, and gems that were released today to go forth with you. We will go ahead and take some time for our questions. Just a reminder, 
please be sure to type your questions into the question box in your Zoom control panel. Now is the time to engage with your alumni and to network. So looks like we have some questions here. So let's go to them. Um, first question says, greetings. How do you believe that you set yourself apart from others in order to get your foot in the door? Um, this is from Jadea Jenkins, CAU 22. And um, um, this can be towards anyone. This is a pop-up question. Um, I, I, let me, I, I can answer that because it was something that I, it was a, a, an act that I did 92, 93 that kind of helped me. And, and the reason why I'm pinpointing this point is because Shaka was probably standing right there the moment that it happened. Um, what I did, what I did was I, I, I chose to do, to, to give the audience an attribute that other DJs beside me wasn't doing. Right. So it was I was vocal when I'm spinning. I'm super hyped. You know, I, I use my voice to to excite the crowd. My voice is just as valuable as the record. So so what I learned was the thing that I offered where it was the one or two attributes that other people weren't doing. Right. So you, you, you take that science, you take that thought process and it's take it further than just DJing. It's it's what a basketball player would do. It's what a teacher would do to separate himself from other professors. It's just it's adding that value. And I think I kind of mentioned that that early on It's adding value to to your position so that when I get hired again, there's a million DJs, there's a million basketball players, there's a million mechanics. But when you come to Mars's doctor office or Mars's carpet cleaning office, it's the one or two things that I'm going to present to the client that mm -hmm. other that other potential uh, uh, competitors don't have and whatnot. So to, to, to separate yourself, you just have to offer more. Now that doesn't mean you cheapen your rate. It actually, me offering more put me in a higher bracket in terms of DJ hierarchy, but I knew early on I had to separate myself from the other pack or else I would have just been amongst the other pack to answer your question shortly. Interesting, yeah. thank you, thank you. Um, and to chime in with, with DJ Ch Ch Chas, this is Chef. For, for me, it was basically saying yes to everything and interning. You know, interning was just so crucial with um, being able to navigate through the whole entertainment sector because I started out in PR. You know, I was in PR for seven years. And I was able to make some connections and move around and then, you know, just learn as much as you can. As DJ Mars said, I just learned so much. I became a generalist in communications, marketing, multimedia. And then I found my path to radio. So internships is saying yes while you can. Exactly, exactly. Um, well, this next question um, is for anyone as well. She said, um, this is from Manya Tomlinson. She said, I'm the librarian serving the mass media arts department here at um, CAU. That's right, I work for club, I work in Club Woody. Oh. Um, <laughs> she said, this question is for um, any panelists. Um, I buy books to add to the library's collection to enrich our scholars' knowledge. Do you have any recommendations of books students should read? Have you read anything that influenced your career and work? If so, please share because I'm trying to acquire them for the library. Thanks for giving, um, giving your time today. I've truly enjoyed it. And if you all like, um, if you want to, you can drop them in the, um, in the panelists, well, in the box, in the chat, so she can just copy and paste them if you have anything that you may want to add. Well, I'll say verbally since I'm operating on this situation. It was um, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People by Steve Covey. And, I mean, that, that just kind of led my life. And, okay. you know. Anyone else? That's a good one. Yeah, um, I would say, I'm trying to remember the exact title of it. It was by, um, um, Damn, what is the exact title? I believe it's The Tanning of America by Steve Stout. Mm -hmm. He just, he perfectly articulates um, how on a higher executive level, he influenced urban culture from, from an executive level. It's all the stuff that I saw 
from a pedestrian side. He just explained it from an executive level so that everything that I saw when I traveled, I see how it happened again from an executive level. So if anyone's out here listening to this conversation, it, clearly it's entertainment based. I feel like that is a great read. So you can just understand exactly how things came about, how, how black kids in New York influenced white kids in Germany, how mm -hmm. black kids in Atlanta influenced Asian kids in Tokyo. That book just articulates it perfectly for me. Thank you. There's a, uh, there's a book uh, called The Talent Code uh, mm -hmm. by, by Daniel Coyle. Um, and uh, the, the term is, you ever heard the term, um, um, hard work beats talent when talent doesn't work? Yep. You know what I mean? Um, it's basically the, the concept of that. You know, greatness, is, greatness isn't born, it's grown. Um, and um, uh, it's definitely a, a really good book for people who are trying to apply uh, hard work with their talent because you know if you're talented and you work hard you know you like Michael Jackson or you Beyonce or you know what I mean because you know, becomes a you know and there are people who are not as talented as the next person but because they put in the work um they get further so um I think that's a really good book to add to uh to, to the list also yeah I would um my, mine's gonna be a little bit more complex answer one I would digress and go back to the question before this industry about separating yourself this industry is an audacity industry to me right you have to you have to actually dare and believe in something that nobody else really can see i mean it's like, like you have to believe in something that's not there yeah <laughs> like brian you gotta think brian writes a record based upon how he's feeling based upon an experience that he's had in the corner of his room he goes and records it and then 20 million people like it do you have to actually believe that your voice matters? That whatever you're, he's writing and saying actually matters to somebody, somebody else. It's audacity. So to Mars's position, it's not a bad thing. I, I like to reframe mindset. And in this industry, the reason why you need to have audacity is because everybody will tell you no, right? Or everybody won't see your vision or everybody's on their own time. And so you have to have more audacity or even ego. And ego is not necessarily a negative thing. Ego to Mars's definition, one of the definitions of ego is to know that you're different. And if you know that you're different, you have something to offer or that even if other people don't see you immediately, my difference <laughs> is the difference, right? Then I will move that into the conversation of how you prepare yourself for that. Obviously, this is a very broad industry. So depending upon if you're a songwriter or you know a, a presenter of music, like Ryan creates music, Mars presents music, you know what I'm saying? Shed, you know, manages and controls and presents music, you know what I'm saying? Guides it, you know what I'm saying? So there's a number of different angles. So there's a number of different books. Um, but because you're dealing with so many different types of people, I literally would say to the, to the young lady who asked the library question, the library is what we need. Because I, I have been able to literally pull from every book it don't matter if it's the autobiography of Malcolm X, the Hitman, 48 Laws of Power, whatever it may be, I've been able to draw from that in any case scenario, based upon my mindset, as well as the goals. Once I get into this room in this world of entertainment, okay, what am I looking at? Who's here? Who's in the room with me? How do I work this room? So there's a number of things. I just think, you know, I know it's, it's cliche. Education is so valuable, however it is, either through experience or through, you know, tutelage. You know what I mean? But, um, you know, I, I mean, I would just, I, since I said, I would say 48 Laws of Power because not from the standpoint of, you know, this book is the how-to book to beat and become Bill Gates and you can sit across from Jay-Z, but yes, you need to understand not only how you can move in the room, but how people use things against you. Because uh, people who read that book, some people inherently think that book is evil, but that's when you sit from a position of non-power, when you sit from a position of power. So you need to sometimes be able to know when somebody's using something, because some people read the same books as you against you. And this is a very, very interactive industry. Forget talent. Talent has to be, the song is the most important thing. And then after that, everything that Mars does, the Shed does, that I do, does nothing but elevate the song to its greatest potential. But depending upon where you're at in this, in this totem pole or in this structure or this pipeline of this entertainment industry, and even if you're a PR person, even if you're a choreographer, 
even if you're a fashion person, a culture person, whatever, now we liquor, people, tech, everything, the worlds are just colliding. Everybody who's involved in and around entertainment and culture is, is an offering of, a, of, a, of a, again, our product. I think Mars said it earlier, it's our greatest export, global. It's America's greatest export, not just ours, America's, right? It is our natural resource. So um, we need all hands on deck, all books to be read because you're going to have to draw for some things. But I would definitely say 48 Laws of Power, um, everything you need to know about the music industry uh, by Ntume, um, and, and the hitmen for, for those who want to be on the executive side or have you creatives, probably I said, um, uh, Brian and, and Mars may have uh, other suggestions there. We're going to take um, one more question and, um, you know, because we don't want to uh, run solely over, although we are open, we want to be respectful of everyone's time. Um, this question is from Joanna Aldridge Wilson. She said, I'm an actress who has been asked to do VO work on an upcoming rapper's record. I am being paid an hourly fee and will be given a percentage of royalties publishing using split sheets. What else do I need to do to ensure I have my financial business in order? I operate as an individual. Thank you. Um, I'll jump in a little bit. I'm, I do a lot of business on these things. Uh, first of all, I think whoever's presenting to give you a great opportunity um, because they don't always give you an opportunity to get publishing on just, just on voiceover. Uh, usually they, they try to get work for hire and own everything and every aspect of that. Royalties are not always offered. So um, I think that's a good thing or your lawyer negotiated a good opportunity. Um, the key thing, and, 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 it's, and I'm gonna reference this because somebody also put it in the chat, thinking, thinking the, the book, Think and, Grow, Think and Grow Rich, right? You also have to prepare your mind for opportunities um, because this industry is like, it's a hurry up and wait game. You do a lot of work and then some at some point the floodgates open. Mm. Money comes in like nobody's business. It looked like it's never gonna end. It's a tidal wave. You're like, I can't spend it. I'm, it's whatever, is, I can't spend it enough. But if you do not prepare your mind as well as your structure to understand what you should own, how that ownership turns, like I said, that little piece of record that you're, you're getting ready to do as a voiceover right now, 10 years, 20 years from now, somebody might hear it, be inspired by it, sample your voice, and then, it become a billion dollar record, right? Mm -hmm. So right now it might be worth a couple of hundred, a couple of thousand, but the future opportunity of that copyright is where, you know, is where is really where it's at. So you have to structure things business-wise to be able to benefit from your work, no matter how little work or how hard work. And we can talk about many stories where we know people that don't benefit from their work. The fact that Brian is able to sit through and go through his catalog and still benefit from that and still be able to see past work and then the rebirth of it. It's, you know, our culture is a cycle. So we're, we're literally, you know, nothing, you know, uh, Nas said it in the record, uh, there's nothing new under the sun. There's, there's a, everybody has said it, there's nothing new. So all we're doing is repeating certain things. And then when we go back to sample, that is our first connection to uh, emotion in song. And so the 90s is so prevalent right now, which is our era, me, Mars, Shed, and, and, and Brian's era, is because he, the, our children or the people that are came behind us, that's what they grew up on, you know what I'm saying? And because they heard us playing it in the cars, the clubs, whatever it is, the child was in the back seat. So now they're like, their first emotional connection when they're seeking emotion, because young people are just being, they're like, well, I need inspiration. So they go back. Right, and then that's when they're grabbing, and, you, and that's why fashion, everything is going in a cycle. It's just being, you know, represented. So mm -hmm. if we are students of history, and if we're going to be business minded, you know, we're celebrating the fact that Swiss and Timberland sold Triller, that Jay Z did the LVA, the LVHM deal, um, title deal, all the deals that are getting done within our culture, that we have to be students to say the cycle that is going right now warrants me doing something here, building it up, selling it off, and then recreating, because we're creative people. And even if it's not me, me opening the doors for young people behind me and structuring them to a point, you know what I'm saying, so that they're able to benefit. Because when we were young, 
nobody would have told us we no one we weren't trying to be best yeah i'm not gonna say the best dj but the top executive we were just trying to be around hip-hop we wanted to dance we wanted to hear music we just wanted to do something mm -hmm. that we like and then when you see billionaires get created off of something within 30 years right we were all and within 30 years we've seen people go from zero money to billionaires that we know like it's 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 it's, it's kind of dumbfounded so it doesn't feel like what you're doing could possibly pay off right now, but now it's even faster. 10 years from now, what you're doing could be, can make you millions, hundreds of millions of billionaires. So you've got to have that business structure and space. So along with, you know, anything else that's going on, prepare your mind and structure for business so that you, your children and two, three other generations, and even if you decide to sell it off to somebody else, at least you're getting some value for your work. Thank you, Shaka. Thank you. Anyone else before we close out? All right. Well, thank you all for your questions. Please stay in contact with our alumni and look out for our um, upcoming events and follow us on our social media platforms at CAU Alumni Relations. Um, panelists, if you all can, uh, please drop your IG or um, LinkedIn, uh, link in the... Uh, in the panel chat. So, you know, our alumni can definitely follow you and get to know you as well as our students. Um, great. Thank you all, everyone. We appreciate your virtual presence and your energy. Special thanks to my colleagues, Senior Director of Alumni Relations, Mrs. Galen E. Gatewood Joshua, and to Dr. Rhodes for always being supreme in service, and to our panelists for an extraordinary job today. Thank you again for joining us and we look forward to seeing you guys um, on our next upcoming one, March 28th. Have a great weekend.